For many of Great Britain's hockey players, this has been billed as the most important weekend of their year, if not their career, so far. With less than nine months to go until the Tokyo 2020 Olympic Games, it is their last chance to secure a place at sport's biggest event. Funding is on the line and reputations are at stake. Spend five weeks of unprecedented access in the lives of Giselle Ansley, Harry Gibson, Chris Griffiths, Maddie Hinch, and Nelly Raya, as they give you insights into the lives of the nation's best hockey players as they prepare for this crucial weekend. With just one month to go until their FIH Olympic qualifier against Chile, Great Britain's women are taking on India in a three test series as part of their preparations. Despite Bisham Abbey not being the most glamorous of locations, for Giselle and Ellie the opportunity to once again represent their country alongside their teammates is one that continues to evoke strong emotions. Every time I put on the um, international shirt, be it England or Great Britain, um, I do get goosebumps. Um, it's incredibly special and it's something that I don't take for granted. I know like, it's kind of a common thing that you hear international athletes say, I never take it for granted, but genuinely you don't. Um, you don't know when the next time will come around that you might pull that shirt on, you may never get another chance. So um, for me, every time I get to pull that shirt on and step out there on that pitch, um, truly is um, incredible. It's just like a buzz about the team and yeah, it's just a special thing to be a part of. I'm not gonna try and describe it because I really can't put it into words, but yeah, it's, I mean, the girls always tease me because in a couple of like my first cap speeches, I've just not really known what to say. So I've said it's pretty cool. So I guess it's pretty cool. <laughs> In what is their last competitive outing before facing Chile, Great Britain take the series 1-0, thanks to two draws and a 3-1 victory, results that leave them full of confidence. <laughs> the opening match of the series also saw Maddie Hinch make her 50th appearance for Great Britain, having made her international debut at the same venue with England back in 2008. Yeah, it was, it was incredibly special to get my 50th actually at Bisham. I was joking about it with the girls. I was like, oh, I'm going to get my 50 GB at Bisham Abbey on a rainy day. But then, like, looking back, it, it was actually really fitting because my first GB cap was here at Bisham Abbey against Germany. I remember, it, I remember the game minute by minute. Um, it was a really special day for me. Um, and uh, so it almost felt fitting to, to get my 50th here. It's, it's really difficult for keepers to get to those real big milestones, particularly as, as GB. So... Yeah, a real special day. Um, we didn't quite get the winner, if I remember rightly. It was a nil-nil thriller. Um, happy with the zero, of course, but um, it wasn't really about the result, the, the occasion. I, I just wanted to make sure I enjoyed the day. Oh, it's massively important that we recognise those, but recognise those milestones. That you know they don't hand it out easily at all. Um, it's a lot of hard work. It's a lot of uh, determination to get to those points um, and it's really important that we as a group come together to recognise each individual player's uh, moments, whether it's a 50th, a first, a 250th, whatever it is, um, that's an incredibly special moment, not just for that player but for the team that's around them um, to be a part of that with them there and then. So uh, yeah, I was very grateful to the girls for putting on a nice little uh, presentation for me and the words from Holly and, and the coaches, you know, they're, they're the sort of stuff that kind of sticks with you for a long, long time. And that's what's really important that we take our time as a group to make sure we handle those occasions properly. Maddie, congratulations. Um, the first one of the group, um, quite quite well, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, also now not the oldest in the group. Yes, we are. Yeah. Um, it's really, I think, tough for a goalkeeper, as Sabs and um, Ted and Will know. Um, it's been a long journey to this point and I think you still have your ups and downs in terms of not, not performance, but <laughs> <laughs> in, in your journey, you 
you don't really appreciate what we all value from you in terms of your experience and how you say things and, and who you are on the pitch and how you train. So well done. Um, keep believing in yourself and keep driving us as well. Keep trusting yourself that what you're saying is the right thing. And we all need that from you, so keep doing that from you. We really, really need that. You're a leader on and off the pitch in how you act, but also what you say. So congratulations. <laughs> I am hugely, hugely proud to be in this position and I know I'm not the easiest teammate to have in this team but I love every single one of you, I 100% believe in us as a group um, and everything that I do is from the heart and I care and I believe in us. Um, I'm super excited to be back here, I'm, I can't thank you a lot enough, I didn't actually think I'd get this, if I'm honest, there was a dark time for me where I thought I was, I was going to call it there, I'm so glad I didn't. Um, we're on a good journey, we'll get there, and um, we all just got to stick together and ride, ride the waves, um, and I'm with you 100%. So thank you. Surprise! <laughs> Maddie returns to international hockey halfway through 2019, having taken time out after representing England at the 2018 Vitality Hockey Women's World Cup. 2018 was a, a, a really difficult year for me, I, I think. It been building for quite some time post Rio. I think a lot of people see the the fun stuff, the good stuff, the exciting stuff that happens and came with a gold medal. But I think a lot of people didn't see how my life changed to a point where I, I was just trying to say yes to everything. I found myself wanting to please everyone. I found myself wanting to do everything that was put in front of me. I kind of lost my way a little bit and you know, I was still trying to play abroad, um, plus give every, all my energy to here, plus give my energy to like Maddie Hinch now seen as a little bit of a brand outside of the hog. Like it was all so surreal to me that I had never, I couldn't understand, I still don't fully understand to this day, but I wanted to do everything to perfection and, and I didn't get the balance right if I'm honest and I burnt myself out and I was, I was knackered and it was a really scary place to be because I suddenly lost my love for the game and I, I find myself turning up to training and, and not particularly wanting to be there. I was just hanging on um, and I didn't necessarily know what to do and I think in the end I came to the decision actually I just need to step away. As well as training and playing regularly, Great Britain's men and women also make a number of athlete appearances throughout the year, visiting schools and clubs across the country and also fulfilling many media requests. This recently included a trip for Maddie to a school in London where she joined up with England cricketer Fran Wilson and England netballer Rachel Dunn to celebrate the work of Team Up. While Maddie loves continuing to inspire the future, she struggled with the huge increase in demand experienced by many of the players who won gold in Rio. I think it's just people wanting a bit of your time, um, people wanting to know your story, people um, putting things in front of you to talk about, uh, decisions to be made, um, yeah, appearances. Oh, it, like I, I wouldn't even know where to start. Like there was just so many little facets to what was happening in my weeks. Whereas before it was like Maddie the athlete. Like it still is that, but it was just I came to Bisham and my, this was my world. This was like pretty much all I focused on. So in between trainings, I'd nap and, and I'd think about what I was going to do for lunch. And now my, you know, my phone goes off more than ever. I'm, I'm planning about trying to tick off certain contractual appearances or whatever. Like there's just more demand for my time and it's, it's tough. And, but it's nothing that I'd ever want to change because this is, if people want your time and people want to hear your story, that means you're doing well. Ball fired in, deflected guards. Here's the chance. Penalty corner, what a save. Having played a key part in Great Britain's Olympic success, Maddie was subsequently named the 2016 FAH Goalkeeper of the Year before also receiving the award in each of the two following years. Despite being proud of this, Maddie admits that she also struggled with the extra level of external pressure and expectation she perceived the accolades placed upon her. I think that was probably the biggest challenge more than anything, the, the, how my name almost came with like a, a um, expected level of performance or that's how I deemed it to be um, which might be I might have got wrong but it was almost like Maddie Hinch will always deliver at this level because again like a lot of people watch something a 60 minute match that showed that but no one saw the six months to the six years building up to that moment where 
I'm human and I get stuff wrong and and I've had my ups and downs and it's not always been the, almost like the perfection that that final was deemed to be or the press said it was. I mean, at the end of the day, I let in three goals, so I didn't see it as perfect at all. Um, but I so badly wanted to then continue to deliver at that level game after game after game because I felt like that's what the outside world was now saying that I had to do. And then if I didn't, there was a lot of more people now commenting on why I wasn't. And I was seeing this all the time and I wasn't used to it. And I just found myself trying to be here all the time and it was exhausting and I and it was emotionally draining um, and uh, and again that's what the break allowed me to really kind of work out like whose opinions do I actually care about to be honest the coaches my family and my teammates while the decision to step away from some of her longest and closest friends may have been a difficult one the squad kept in constant contact with Maddie before welcoming her back with open arms I can't thank the group enough for how great they were while I was away. Like, they gave me the space I needed, but they almost didn't leave me too far away to think that they almost had forgotten. It was like constantly checking in. They were super excited to see what I was doing and, and what I was doing my time off. And, you know, that meant a huge amount to me. And then to, to have like them, me coming back in and them just having their arms all open to just be like, we're super excited to have you here. The moment they heard it came back, like, I pretty much heard from everyone in the squad about how pleased they were again little like bits of effort like that from the girls was massive for me because I didn't really know how that was going to be um, and the goalkeepers in particular like it, that was tough for them and they've they've been great um, so yeah I, it was a special day it felt like first day at school all over again um, but that's the feeling that I wanted I wanted that reset I wanted that let's start afresh um, and that's exactly how it felt and it's and that's how it's been ever since really Having returned after a week away playing in Spain, the men's team are on a decentralised break away from Bisham Abbey. Despite this, Harry and fellow Great Britain men's keeper George Pinner are in for an extra training session with goalkeeping coach Mark Hickman. This is one of many goalkeeper specific practices they will undertake in the lead up to the FIH Olympic qualifiers. And while it means they spend more time at Bisham than anyone else, Harry knows just how important these sessions are for ensuring they are in the best place leading up to the most important weekend of 2019. Yeah, I do really enjoy the X sessions. I think they, because goalkeeping, because of the nature of goalkeeping where you can turn up fully prepared, you've slept well, you've eaten well, you're ready to go and then you don't touch the ball. Like, that over time that can be frustrating and you know it's just part of goalkeeping but what's nice is then to come out with the goalie coach and make 200 saves in a session you know you're getting it you know with it like stuff like that so it's just yeah it's much more you're much more involved it takes the uncertainty out of it um, and you know that is more fun and you can feel yourself getting better at stuff whereas again in games like I said you might have worked on that lunge for six months not used it in a game once and then you'd finally someone has a shot down there and you get to make that save um, so yeah I, th I really enjoy it from a from a progress and um, practice point of view those, those sessions are really fun I think one of the main differences between goalkeepers and outfield is that the technical aspect so it's goalkeeping is more of a closed skill in my opinion goalkeepers should do a lot more technical uh, stuff football goalkeepers are the same if you watch them they they rarely train with the full team it's mostly just with the goalie coach and then they chuck them in so we do a bit more of that but um, it's really important for grooving technique um, you know you have to do a hundred lunges on one side in a week or in a session if you try and get 100 lunges in gameplay scenario, that will take you two years uh, because it just doesn't come up. So you have to rep certain movements and the only way you can do that is with a goalkeeper coach. Despite the fact that they are fighting for just one place, Harry and George enjoy a good friendship that makes these sessions that bit more enjoyable. Me and George are mates. It's, it's, it's such a funny thing, the goalkeeper relationship. Um, you're always... You spend the most time with each other out of probably any two people in the squad. George and I probably spend the most time in close proximity. Um, and yet, you're competing against each other um, the whole time. 
uh, for the place and you know since I joined the program five years ago or whatever like we've you know we've spent that much time together but also you're always competing um, so it is a really weird dynamic George and I personality wise are very different anyway um, he's a massive extrovert very loud um, bit of a lad's lad I'm a massive introvert <laughs> prefer the quiet and not really a lad's lad so yeah like we are different but you spend that much time with any one person you're going to end up being mates and I think that's the, the thing with hockey right you um you're all here because you're good hockey players, but you end up becoming really close mates because you just spend so much time together. Like concentration face. <laughs> the women's team are also on a decentralised week, but each individual still has a training plan set for them which they must complete with those who live locally often coming into Bisham to use the world-class facilities on offer. During the week One they must get through a certain ten. number of gym and running sessions to ensure they return as fit and as sharp as possible, something which is especially important when major matches and tournaments are just around the corner. <laughs> we obviously in kind of our decentralized weeks um, we can't call them break weeks because they're not a break you're still training hard um, but you can go and you can gym or do your running sessions or your hockey sessions wherever you choose to do them um, sometimes it's nice to, to just get in there in your own headspace and just do it yourself but other times it's great to be with your teammates and you know you, you do help motivate each other through it but to be honest it doesn't take much to motivate you to do them because if you don't you're not just letting yourself down you're letting your whole team down because you're then not going to be in the space that or the kind of physical space that you need to be when you come back the following week or when we get to a tournament you know every session counts maintaining kind of fitness and um, kind of physical strength and stuff is incredibly important to keeping us on the pitch that's the main thing if we're not robust enough you can't tolerate the load on the hockey pitch the load you know eight games in 14 days for an Olympic Games, that is a huge amount of, of work that's gonna go through your body. And if you haven't done the work kind of off the hockey pitch, in the gym, kind of prehab, rehab, all of those kind of sessions, our daily prep sessions that we do, if you haven't done them, and if you don't do that properly, your body won't be able to sustain the intensity that it needs to. Um, so yeah, they are incredibly important. These break weeks are also a crucial time for the athletes to step away from hockey, relax and focus on themselves. Alongside often using the time to visit her family in Devon, Giselle also has one particular hobby she loves to occupy her time with. So outside of hockey, I am an avid baker and I love cooking. Um, definitely something that helps me kind of relax if I ever relax that much um, so that's one side of, of kind of me um, being kind of someone who is now more senior in the team um, you don't like kind of you think about stuff a lot lot more than I, I used to and so then my brain needs to switch off at some points I'm not very good at it I'm really really bad at it um, but I'm learning that you can't just go, 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 365 days of the year, the whole 24 hours a day kind of thing. So, yeah, it's definitely very important um, and I do really, really value it. Another thing I really enjoy doing, and this is in my kind of rest periods and stuff when I'm supposed to be sitting down or relaxing, um, I like to do scrapbooks. Um, so as you can see here, actually, this is right back at Rio. Um, yeah. Lots of pictures of Rio and just kind of trying to make it look fancy. And then I also um, turn around, it's huge, yeah. Um, when I've been traveling, so after the Olympics, I actually went to New Zealand. Um, this is where I traveled. Um, so, yeah, I really enjoy doing things like this, and I think that's, yeah good way for me to relax and reminisce, I guess. Catch you see! Oh. <laughs> good bit of filming. Yeah, good.
cracking bit of screw on Jackie. <laughs> Chris and Giselle share a house with fellow GB athletes Ollie Willars, who they have lived with for five years, and Liam Ansell, who moved in during early 2019. As well as the fun that comes alongside living with good friends, both Giselle and Chris also enjoy the fact that their housemates understand the types of interaction they need each day. Not only does this help them grow closer as friends, for the men it could also help them with their interaction on the pitch too. It's good fun, it is good fun. Um, you get to kind of come home and everyone sort of understands what you're doing, you do day to day. Um, yeah, there's sort of no expectation on you to live your life through other people or what they want you to do. You can kind of come home, be yourself, relax. It's good fun. Um, it's quite nice that the people you live with know kind of what you're doing, um, what it feels like. Kind of emotions that you go through, yeah, so it's pretty good. We don't tend to talk that much hockey. Um, we talk a lot about football, a lot of other sports, um, how bad Ollie is at FIFA, that sort of stuff. Um, but yeah, occasionally a bit of hockey, but yeah, not too much, which is quite nice. Oh! oh is that clip stumps? No, it's... What? Clip my leg. Oh! Chris, Chris. Oh. Have a word for yourself. <laughs> we can sort of read each other quite well. Whether we need a pick up and a, and a sort of laugh or a joke or uh, a kind of sit down cup of tea and a more serious chat, um, which is something that we're definitely, um, definitely a lot better at now, particularly the last couple of years sort of moving into this house. Um, and it's something that's really good and I think we're, we're good. We're good for that. I think we're actually, really, that's what we're really good at. We're really supportive of each other. I think that's really nice, um, you know. They'd always message before a game, good luck, blah, 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 always know the result. Even if, you know, they might be training, so therefore they can't watch. But um, I, I don't think it's like an expectation that we have to do that. I think we just want to do that to support each other. And also things like injuries and going through things like that. I remember 2016 when Griff kind of did his ACL and stuff like that, um, you know, trying to help him through those pits and and bobs like that and then you know when you then get an injury and then you can kind of be like well you know it puts it into perspective really having more meaningful conversations about general life definitely helps having harder conversations during training uh, and sort of more meaningful conversations around training and having that kind of openness in a living environment at home definitely benefits out on the, on the, out on the pitch There are some downsides to having four professional hockey players living under the same roof though. The smell of the hockey kit, <laughs> definitely the worst. Um, there is, and we have so much of it, like training twice a day, especially when it's raining and you've got soaking wet shoes, shin pads and everything, you're trying to dry it all. The kit smells so bad. Um, the laundry, like a Chinese laundry in here, there's endless amount of washing, you can have to squeeze past clothes dryers and whatnot to sit down, um, which is definitely the bad bit. It's the best bit, um, they'll probably rip me for this, but they are generally great fun and really nice guys. And they do look out, they look after me and they look out for me, so yeah, I'm really appreciative of that. So yeah, we are just sort of four friends living together who happen to do a pretty cool job, which is playing for your country. Oh my God, right, game over. That's about an inch. I'll figure out. Get out. As well as his housemates, Chris likes to spend as much time as he can with his partner Beth, a world and European medalist with British rowing. The two first met in the gym at Bisham Abbey three years ago, but it did take a little bit of persuasion to convince them to start dating. Well, okay, so I moved down to Henley in 2016 whilst everyone was away at Rio. Um, and Chris unfortunately wasn't there because of his knee injury. So he was on the bike and that's when I first spotted Chris. Uh, it took me a while to say hello. Um, <laughs> you're laughing because it's true. And then it took me another, what, year or two later for me to pluck up the courage to actually go and say hello to him in the gym and try and get him on a date. That's Not entirely. You said hello the first time. Yeah, okay, I said hello. And then the I just thought, ah, she's having me. I thought it was a bet, to be honest, at first. And yeah. then, yeah, and then it took what, but probably about a year and a half for us to actually 
me to agree to go on a date with you. Yeah, and that was after my friends started shouting at you at Sports Personality yeah. on the dance floor. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The injury that saw Chris miss Rio hit him hard. But being with Beth has taught him how to open up and talk about his feelings, something he knows was crucial in his recovery and return to the sport. It took me probably about a week or two to actually tell my parents that I was injured and that I'd be out for a year. Um, so the biggest thing I've learned from that experience is opening up and talking to people, um, particularly through the good times but mainly the bad times. And that's um, something that I've definitely done a lot more with Beth. Um, so sort of being able to to sort of communicate if I'm feeling well or if I'm having a bad day and I think that's um, that's the biggest thing that we've worked on um, is our communication and sort of how we are around each other which has definitely helped our relationship massively. Beth has also endured her fair share of tough times having been unable to row for two years because of a life-altering illness. But despite all of this they know these challenges have only made them stronger as a couple. I feel like he's never seen the best version of me in terms of at my best performance in rowing, at my happiest, at my healthiest um, and that's because in 2017 just after the World Champs I was in debilitating back pain and that's pretty much when me and Chris died, well that's when we became, to, like, became a couple and it took just under a, a year for me to be diagnosed with endometriosis. Um, which is massive at the moment in terms of just raising awareness for it and it, it's basically where scar tissue um, during a woman's period grows elsewhere in the body and then during the time of the month it bleeds but because it has nowhere to go it just builds more and more scar tissue and I had an operation in July last year where they found scar tissue around my bowel and my appendix so unfortunately Chris has had to witness me not being able to row been very depressed, very unhappy with who I am, what was happening and I mean for him it's, it, it, I've, I have put a lot of pressure on him but he has supported me through it all and he has been there through it all which I, you know, I can't thank him enough for. It's good sort of having the knowledge of what it's like to be injured and missing out on competition um, whether that be Monopoly deal or rowing or anything, having that competitive element of, of your life it taken away from you is, is something that no matter what sport you're in you can understand and you, you understand if you're go, going through that even if you play 4th 11 club hockey like my, my dad does um, not being able to play is, is yeah it's really really tough and it's such a hard thing to go through the situation that I had was was very clear cut I knew as soon as I got injured that that was it my Olympic dream was over for that for that year um, I was going to be sort of minimum eight, nine, ten months out um, and I kind of knew exactly what I had to do to kind of get back um, whereas Beth is, has and is still very different um, so I think the biggest thing that I've learned is is supporting when I need to support and kind of letting Beth speak to me about when she wants help because I think at the start I was very forceful and trying to help too much and I've been through this, I've been through that, this is what you should do, um, but obviously every scenario is different, um, so sort of, sort of being more ears and listening to what Beth is going through and then sort of seeing how I can help, if at all, in that sort of situation. I feel like we're now the best we've ever have been because of those tough times and it's funny because we, we said all along like we've really been thrown at the deep end here with what we've both had to overcome as a couple because not only has it been one of us it's been both of us with Christmas and out with the World Cup and obviously with me with my injury um, and now I think we've, we're coming out the other side of it and it's it's just like a breeze now and obviously when when it all happened that's when we got the dog and I think he's also helped us massively as well. With Tokyo 2020 on the horizon Chris and Beth are both harbouring ambitions to represent yeah. Team GB on the sport's biggest stage this summer. I mean, the dream scenario would be we both go to the Olympics and we both do well there. Um, and and being able to sort of share that with each we other. We did have be. to have the conversation last year about if one of us went and the other one didn't, what would happen then? And we both sort of said, well, we'd go out and watch the other one regardless. Because, you know, we've, seen, we've been through it the past four years, seeing each other go through the ups and downs, so we'd want to support each other. Yeah. Um, Danny gets really good engagement um, for Post around his struggle and adversity. He has a really interesting story. Um, he's got 10 siblings. 
he was brought up um, in London, moved to Bristol, he had issues with racism and stuff like this, he was growing up basically. And While all of the athletes are centrally contracted and therefore full-time hockey players, many of them are also encouraged to take up working positions alongside this to broaden their skill sets. This includes Harry, who, alongside Hannah Martin, is undertaking an internship as a sports marketing executive with Oprah, as well as providing something different to look forward to during the week. This is also a crucial part of an athlete's development, as it teaches them other skills outside of sport to prepare them for life beyond hockey when they eventually make that transition. Uh, yeah, no, it's been good. Everyone's been really friendly and accommodating. Um, it is different, obviously, and like, it's a different environment, the kind of office, more professional environment. It's just trying to get to grips and realise that you can actually, you know, work in an office and do those normal things rather than um, just being physical. So, uh, yeah, there's certain things, there's certain etiquette, there's, um, you know, meetings, like making people cups of tea and stuff that we don't usually have to do. But, um, yeah, it's good just getting to grips with all that. Wearing a shirt as well. And wearing a shirt, <laughs> ironing a shirt more importantly. I've never had to do that before, That's, it takes me way longer than it should. You can't play sport forever, um, and especially in sport like ours, like you're not going to be able to live off your earnings forever. Um, so I think it's really important, and I think it's kind of twofold. It's, it's what you're going to do afterwards, and can you put your mind at, at ease as to, okay, I'm going to be able to work and have professional skills and stuff so that when I retire, whether that be, you know, through injury, that could be tomorrow or whenever that ends up being, but also there's a mental health and kind of um, performance aspect to it as well, which is get your head away from hockey. Um, and this is, you know, this is one day a week for us where you can sit, you know, in the office and just do something completely different and test your brain in different ways and different skills and challenges, which I think is really important. How do you align those two things up? How are, you, how are you able to bring them together? Or how are you able to actually make them really separate? You know, when you tell your friends how many hours of the day you actually work, they're always, they always laugh, because obviously you can only physically train for, you know, four or five hours in a day. Um, the big issue then comes kind of the mental application to actually doing difficult challenges with your brain. Um, and that's been interesting coming in here, like if we have a really tough Monday, Tuesday, and we come in here on the Wednesday, like you're just a bit, you know, <laughs> that's our recovery day. And the reason we have that on a Wednesday is because everyone's knackered. Um, so yeah, there's a mental aspect where actually like, if you've really beasted yourself in training and stuff, and you, you know, the recovery is, trying to switch off um, because it is, it is taxing on your brain and everything else. So um, yeah, it's important, to, <laughs> it's important to find that rest where you can find it. But like I said, like coming here and doing something different is actually sometimes as good as a rest. So. A number of the athletes are also undertaking university degrees alongside being professional hockey players. Ellie is one of those, currently working on a PhD with Loughborough University having completed her undergraduate degree there earlier in 2019. So the PhD, well, excitingly enough, is within hockey, um, looking at safety of players and sort of standards around goalkeeper helmets and face masks. But I'm really excited by the prospect of it and just started to crack on with it now, so it's, it's exciting. It's not always the easiest of tasks to juggle studying and hockey, especially when it comes to exam time, as they can often fall in the build-up to or even during major competitions as Ellie discovered before the 2018 World Cup. However, she also enjoys the opportunity that studying gives her to take her mind off hockey and vice versa. I think the balance and having something that you're able to switch off from hockey or I can go and work or if it's work's getting too much I can go and just focus on hockey for a bit. Um, that balance is really, really important to me. And I think ultimately the aim is that I'd love to keep playing hockey for another six or seven years, but you just don't know what the sport's gonna throw at you. Um, and ultimately, I will have a career one day after hockey, um, and I want to be ready for it. Some of my course mates always used to tease me because I'd miss a lecture or I'd miss a lab and I'd have no clue. And, and it just sort of brings you back down to earth that what's going on sort of outside of our bubble, um, which is grounding, which is nice. 30, I can't remember numbers right, 30 million. I think we had four weeks of holding camp, pretty much, or of test matches where we'd go into Lee Valley. And the first one, which was just before selection for the World Cup, um, yeah, I sat an exam in the hotel that morning and the girls went off to play Ireland. So, yeah, we've had our fair share, but then there's a fair few of us that sit exams or have sat exams remotely or 
while you've been away, people sit them in Spain, like places like that, or travel out late to trips. Um, so yeah, at the moment there's a fair few people that are studying and have got exams, so sort of that period of time is quite good that if you do need some focus or something you can sort of pop to someone else, like you've got Tess or Lizzie for example, um, he'll be revising as well, so you can join the Wednesday Study Club. <laughs> This is another example of athletes being encouraged to prepare for life after sport, with one particular individual providing significant help for the GB hockey stars. Emma Mitchell, our performance lifestyle manager, she's amazing. She really helps you and then maybe if you've not got something going on she can sort of send ideas your way and prod you in the right direction. Um, and yeah, like we have Wednesdays off as our dual aspiration days. Um, so you have time and you make time work and yeah, if you want to do it, you make it work. And I say the coaches, the staff are also supportive of it. And it's really exciting sort of when someone gets like a new job or a new opportunity pops up, like everyone in the team is genuinely really excited for them because it is just preparing for the next stage, I guess. When not on international duty or studying, Ellie also enjoys playing club hockey for East Grinstead at the weekends. Nearly all of the Great Britain athletes play for domestic teams throughout the season to maintain their sharpness and competitive edge, while they also relish training and playing in a different environment to what they experience during the week. Yeah, I absolutely love club hockey. Um, I joined a club when I was about 14 or 15 and every weekend you just look forward to it. There's the element that it is a lot more relaxed because you don't have the contact time together, so when you get there you don't overthink things, you just play and you just make the most of it and I mean obviously I'm fortunate enough that I come from my job being playing hockey all week um, whereas some of the girls they come from we've got teachers, we've got people living and working in big fancy jobs in London like all sorts, everyone comes from different backgrounds and when you get there on that Saturday or on that Thursday or Tuesday evening everyone's there for the same reason just to have fun and to play hockey other aspects of club hockey that Ellie loves are being able to interact with the hockey family, coming up against her international teammates and helping to develop the stars of the future. The latter point is one that is particularly important to her as she recognises just how pivotal clubs are for producing the next generation of British talent that will allow the country to continue fighting for global medals. Like You can go to any hockey club pretty much around the country and you'll see someone that you've played with before or coached or used to play with your parents or something like that, sort of everyone really does know everyone. It's like the what, the six degrees of separation and all that. Everyone knows everyone within the hockey world. Um, so it's amazing. And then, yeah, it's just when you see players' journeys, especially like the youngsters coming through, and then you see them playing in the first team and things like that, it's sort of that pride, that homegrown talent. It just makes you exciting like to see the progression. And also, actually, this is a journey that I came on and it's exciting to be a part, potentially, of other people's journeys as they come through. Playing against sort of the other girls in the team is just... Obviously, we train all week together and then you go off on the weekend, pull on your club kit, and it's just that rivalry that... I mean, normally there's some tension between the week, sort of the teasing, big weekend coming up, all of that. And then you get there and it's just a uh, let's play. Um, and it's nice, you, you sort of, you feel like you've got one up, but then they've got one up on you as well, because like, they know what you're going to do, but you know what they're going to do, um, type thing. So it is, it's just fun, and you do run around that pitch, and often you're just smiling and laughing, because you're just enjoying it so much. Like generally, like me and Lily, we've joked before, how whenever we play club hockey, we always end up on the same side of the pitch, and then it's just like a massive running race between us, um, which always then gets even more competitive, sort of, but in another different dynamic. Um, so yeah, it's fun and it is always, you don't shy away from it on the pitch, you embrace it with the other girls on the opposition teams, you have to give it your all. Clubs are massively important for the continued growth of the sport. Um, I'd say it's where you learn to play the game, to love the game, to enjoy it and just to get involved really. And then now at this level it's just great fun, you're going out there. I'm lucky enough down at East Grinstead we've got a great bunch of girls and there's so many players there internationally and like ex-internationals that I can learn from and develop my game from that. It's just, it's really cool, it just brings a big, big, big smile to your face. 
massively going forward. Clubs have a huge part to play. With less than a week to go until the FIH Olympic qualifiers, the players are travelling down to Stratford, East London, where they will be in camp and until the, the games masters. have been completed. They may spend most of their regular weeks in close proximity, but it's in situations like these, when they are living in each other's pockets, that they really see the personalities their teammates possess. So you've obviously got, you know, some of your jokers and those that are more relaxed and kind of very sociable around the group, the likes of um, Lily. Four days to go, woo! Han. Yes, Han. <laughs> <laughs> then you've got, you know, Captain Holly, who's very kind of calm and composed and making sure that everything is just so. I don't even know them. Oh, no, no, just I don't know. Inside out, Maddie, you don't know how to take care of it. That's not inside out. That's not inside out. That is inside out. And then you got we got the youngsters. So we had Shazza, we had Izzy, Lizzie, Tess, um, who are just you know a, a great laugh. They they're lapping up every bit of knowledge that they possibly can, um, but also providing some entertainment of their own. <laughs> there are a whole range of kind of personalities and then um, and people in, that make our team what it is and how special it is, it is to be involved in it. While there may be plenty of fun to be had in camp, Harry knows that as game day draws closer, tensions can start to build within the team. Yeah, the mood in camp, kind of building up to stuff like that is always interesting. Um, I'd say it probably varies mostly between individuals. So as a team, you, you do see a bit of a rise and it's interesting, like we'll play football or something and you can tell everyone's a bit on edge, a bit tetchy or whatever, um, if it's like the day of a game or day before a game or something. Actually, day before is usually worse. Day of, people are usually like, right, we're doing it, it's fine. I think day before you're thinking a bit too much, whatever, but it's, yeah, it's individuals. I think Will Cownan, um, gets too excited. The young guys, but Karen especially, you know, they get excited, they get more irritating as it gets close to that first game and then they level off. The pressure on the athletes was heightened to unprecedented levels too, with the players knowing there could be no mistakes. If they didn't win, they were not going to the Olympics. Usually the pressure is on, say, a semi-final final, but you're not thinking about the semi-final final, you're thinking about the whole tournament. So. The, it, you kind of work your way into the tournament and then by the time you qualify for the same final it's like oh I've only got a day so you feel the pressure but it's actually different whereas Olympic qualifiers was like right we've got three months to qualify, to play these two games um, so I think actually it probably built a bit more than that. The pressure was enormous there's no hiding from it I've never felt anything like it and I said to a lot of the girls afterwards you'll never feel pressure like that again until the next Olympic qualifier. Like, yes, of course, Olympic Games is pressurised and every international match we play is pressurised. But that level of pressure was something that I don't think anyone, unless you played in it, could fully understand. Maybe straight after the Europeans, um, when we hadn't qualified from that, I there was definitely, we had like a week off or whatever, and I definitely had some more um, kind of anxious feelings around it, um, knowing that, wow, we've not actually ever had to do this before. It was a new way of qualifying for the Olympics. Like None of us had ever been in that situation. Chris and Ellie can only watch on though, with the former picking up a small injury just a few days before the games, while Ellie was not selected in the final 18. Selection's part of our sport, um, part of elite sport, and it always has been, always will be, and it's never gonna be easy. Um, what, there's 26 of us, I think, that train full-time here at Bisham. And for Olympic qualifiers, we always knew only 18 would get to go. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's part of it. It's, it's never an easy time within the squad, but most people have been sort of on both sides of it. So everyone sort of knows how to handle themselves and how to react. And 
sort of the right things or what you want to hear and just making sure that you're right and they'll look after you and then obviously injuries you never know like we all have to be ready still maybe that selection and that 18 was picked but it's only up until that whistle goes when actually you've done your job um, the preparation and playing and training we had sort of two or three weeks of training before they go and play like we couldn't just hang your heads upset it was we still had a job to do and to make sure that the girls were in the best shape going forward meant that we need to train to our best ability so they were ready to go. I mean it was it was frustrating, um, not as frustrating as other injuries I've had um, because I knew it was just a little niggle, it was just bad timing, unfortunate, uh, unfortunate timing but um, it kind of made me a lot more relaxed in some respect, um, not having the pressure of playing then in other respect of being so nervous you didn't have any influence on, on the outcome of it. Um, so, yeah, good, good and bad. I mean, thankfully it was only sort of two or three weeks out, which wasn't too bad. Sometimes it could act as a sort of a kick. Um, everyone obviously takes it very differently. I think for me it's always you're just wanting to learn and wanting to improve and wanting to get better and trying to work on your game and say, right, what, what do I need to do to make sure that the next time the selection email comes out, I'm going to be on the right side of it um, and in that squad. Every time you do have a little setback, and if it's a year out or, or two months or a week or so, it just kind of gives you that extra determination to, to kind of get your head down and, and focus. Um, particularly seeing all the hard work that had gone into the qualification, um, it kind of made you yeah, feel part of something special and, and kind of want to get back into that. So um, there's an extra determination, obviously, it being an Olympic year, um, something that I massively aspire to as a as a hockey player is to get there as well uh, and to do well there um, so that kind of adds that extra motivation. After two months of preparations the wait is over. It's finally time for Great Britain to try and book their places at Tokyo 2020. Nerves are often a good thing um, and shows it means something to you and, and People have their own routines as to how they kind of overcome those nerves or how they channel the nerves to create something positive for them on the pitch. Um, but there's also excitement. Of course, there's excitement around the team. Um, there's a little buzz. There's a quiet confidence. Um, and there's also a real steely determination and focus. And that was definitely the case before the Olympic qualifier. You could just kind of see in people's eyes and the way they went about their business. There was, you know, this is kind of crunch time. Playing in front of the Pride during such an important weekend also creates an extra layer of excitement for the players that hits his peak as they run out of the tunnel. Playing at Lee Valley in front of big crowds has been really, really, um, really great. And like I said, with Pro League we were away a lot and you get to play in front of different crowds but it's not it's not the same as running out in front of friends and family and fans of British hockey um, so yeah that's always a always a really special moment. There's no words can try I get goosebumps every single time we run out the tunnel it's so special playing at home there's there's nothing quite like it and like I say it doesn't really matter if there's like a few people there or a massive crowd it's just special to be able to you know play in front of that yeah play at your home ground and, and do it in front of people that really want to be there. Great Britain's women are first to take to the field and their first half against Chile is a nervy affair as they dominate possession but cannot open the scoring. The game, it was the most nerve-wracking um, 30 odd minutes of hockey that I've ever played. Um, and then it was just nice to hear like Mark and the coaches at half time be like, guys, take the handbrake off now, let's go. We'd had all of these conversations before that it would be tight, it would be a bit nervy, um, that, you know, you can't, although they're ranked, they were ranked, what, 19 in the world and everyone expects you to beat them, it's an Olympic qualifying game. It is going to be tight, it's going to be close. And um, yeah, and I just remember when Izzy scored and she finally celebrated. We've been trying to get Izzy to celebrate scoring a goal for so long, even for Surbiton, she never used to celebrate. Um, and that moment, I think, showed just how much it meant to everybody. That opening goal from Izzy Petter allowed the side to relax in the second half and they added two further strikes from Hannah Martin and Anna Toman 
to take a commanding 3-0 lead into the second leg. The biggest smile in Lee Valley. The men also take some time to settle in the opening stages of their game against Malaysia, heading into half-time 1-0 down thanks to a goal from Nabil Noor. But an outrageous finish from Sam Ward at the start of the third quarter opens the floodgates, with the team producing some exquisite hockey in the second half to win the first leg 4-1. Here come Great Britain into the circle and the touch on is in from Sam Ward. It is a quite wonderful finish. Well, and Oltmans was talking about now how uh, it needs to stand firm for Malaysia. That's lovely. Oh, my word. Forsyth has got it. The build up was magnificent. And he's one away from his milestone moment. Well the women the carry on in the second leg Britain. where they left off Cruz, from the first, Townsend, Townsend raising into an early 2-0 lead thanks to goal. Tess Howard and Laura Unsworth the on their way the to an eventual 5-1 aggregate Tessa victory Howard. that ensures Great they will be competing at Tokyo. Unsworth's goal in particular was cheered loudly by fans and teammates alike, recognition that she very much deserves having been such a crucial player for the team over a number of years. does Laura Unsworth and what a fine finish that is! Yeah, Unzi, yeah. I was actually, I think I was laughing a little bit when Un scored um, because we've watched her hit so many over the bar in training and, and we've always been joking with Unz like one day you're going to score a screamer. So it was just so nice for someone who's been here so long and achieved what she has to have that moment. Uh, to score an absolute beaut on her backhand, um, she couldn't have placed it better and I was just, yeah, we were all just so delighted for her, I think you saw it on her face about how shocked she was, but again, like, no one really deserved it better to have her moment. It was to prove a very special day for Alan Forsyth too, as he scored his 100th international goal and bagged a hat-trick to take the men to a 5-2 victory on the day and 9-3 overall, as they ensured GB Hockey will have full representation out in Japan. It's a monster of an area ball and it's well brought down by Martin. Here goes Martin. Martin into the circle, feeding Ward. Ward getting his head up and Ward with a ridiculous finish, shaped to cross it. Kumar bought it and Ward fires it into the net to make it 2-0 to Great Britain. Uh take it and here is an opportunity a great chance here far post and it's in for Scythe gets his second and Great Britain's fourth Kumar to his right and this time he beats him to his left and it is a hat trick for Alan Forsyth despite trying to prepare for this weekend as they would any other the players knew how much pressure they had put themselves under coming into the Olympic qualifiers, which led to an outpouring of one particular emotion for all of them come the final whistle. Relief was kind of the first thing that went through my mind. I was just like, thank goodness for that. Um, and we've done it. And then it was kind of enjoy the moment. My mum said to me last week, actually, when I was at home, she was like, you celebrated almost as much as you did when you won gold. And I said, yeah. I said, because that's how much it meant that, you know, we've qualified the GB team to go to the Olympic Games and, you know, give us another shot at it. The whistle went, a relief, it was amazing. Um, obviously, watching the girls, I'd done my bit in training to best prepare them, but obviously I couldn't do anything on those two days. Um, I had full faith that the girls were going to smash it. Um, but I say that whistle, when it went, it was just, right, tick that one off and now you've got something big to build for. It was a big relief, I think, and I think that's how most of the guys took it. You know, we, we always imagined we would qualify for the Olympics and when, you know, 
you've been in the program however long and you that's your goal you you never think oh we might actually not qualify until the two months you know building up to this uh, this weekend where you do feel that um, so then it was kind of like two months actually it might not happen and then you know we dominate them like win fairly comfortably execute the plan it's like right but it was it was relief I think was the biggest thing it's like yes we're going and relief to begin with a lot of excitement about the next kind of eight nine months um, and at the time it was just yeah an enjoyable experience to be a part of just sort of seeing the hard work that had gone in from everyone um, and that kind of excitement of yeah we've, we've done it let, let's kind of kick on now the number one emotion was relief if anyone says anything different I'll be shocked because it was just pure relief, like, thank goodness it's over, <laughs> was like how I felt, like, whoop, thank goodness, because, yeah, it was just so nice to know that, like, we know now what's lined up, whereas there was just so much uncertainty around what happens if we don't, um, and we deserved it, like, you know, the pressure, not just as a, a young group that we are, but as, as reigning Olympic champs to make sure we get it done, you know, it's a target on your back, that, that title, and, and, the press had almost gone a little bit into what happens if the Olympic champions don't qualify rather than the Olympic champions are looking good or whatever like it you could kind of see it building like oh my goodness so I think full credit to the group for really kind of dealing with it in a hugely professional way you saw a lot of teams a lot of big teams you know get it quite wrong in the first game and I think we showed that we can handle this pressure we can handle the fact that we are Olympic champions we're starting to embrace that more than ever and enjoy it which is great to see and that target in your back is something that you can either fear or embrace and I think it's still constantly trying to remind the group that how many people would love to be able to say we are current Olympic champions whether there's four of us five of us ten of us left in in that Olympic team it doesn't matter we are the current Olympic champions going into the next Olympic Games we must embrace it we must carry that with us into every game we play and use that to fuel us like puff out our chest and be like yeah we are and this is why we are rather than everyone stepping up to beat us because of who we are like they're all going to play that a little bit better yeah stuff that like like we are the team to beat and it's exciting yes it's different so the group that went into Rio in terms of we were very kind of like under the radar going into it no one really saw us going to do what we did and now it's it's different so we no one in the team knows how to deal with that but I think we're learning more from how it's been over the last four years as to how we need to approach this tournament and it's yeah not fearing fearing that title like my goodness it's such a special one to have and very few people get to have it so let's embrace it and and take that into the tournament. While the focus for the players has now switched onto the upcoming FIH Pro League season and the subsequent Olympic competition, some have also started to think about what life beyond Tokyo may look like for them. Uh, it's been something that's been on my mind. Um, sort of, my I idea at the moment is kind of I'd love to carry on, continue playing, um, particularly with the Commonwealth Games being in Birmingham. Um, that's sort of my hometown so to, to kind of get there and, and sort of have friends and family come and watch would be would be pretty special so uh, no plans of retiring just yet but as I said you never know what's going to happen or yeah what could happen between now and now in Tokyo. I have thought about it um, definitely and um, I, there's a lot more I'd still like to achieve. Um, I obviously want to to would love would love to be on that plane to Tokyo um, to defend our title um, and but I would also really love to try and win a Commonwealth title and I'd love to um, go to another World Cup um, so yeah there is a lot more I'd like to achieve in the sport um, but that won't necessarily be down to my own choice. Um, you know, I have to keep playing well. I have to train hard. I have to stay fit. And I have to be wanted and thought of in the coaches' plans as well. So, you know, it's not just... I'll, I'll put myself in the best possible place that I can do, but it won't necessarily come down to me and those decisions. Yeah, look, there's, there's no doubt that I've thought about life beyond Tokyo, of course. Um, but when I start thinking about it, I try and kind of pull myself back in a little bit. I don't want to get too focused on um, life after Tokyo too much. It's very unknown for me. Um, I am 
very much taking my kind of time here day by day these days. I think that was a problem that I had in the past is that I look too far forward and I'm just trying to enjoy being fit and healthy, playing well, being lucky to be here and, um, and I'm just trying not to get too carried ahead. It's not that I'm not setting myself up potentially to retire. That could happen, but I could also not. There are definitely things that I would love to go on. You know, I feel like a Commonwealth gold medal is still something that we should have and that this group could go on to have. But again, I, I would need to, one, you know, feel like I can give what I can to the team, be enjoying the game and be fit enough to, you know, to, to be able to give what I can to this group and to this programme. So I can't say where I'll be with all those three things uh, until after Tokyo. So I'll have another think about it probably once that's done. For now, though, their focus is solely upon performing as well as they can over the next few months and ensuring they make the most of what promises to be an exciting 2020. Drinks and the bar for the next 30 minutes are on us. I think these, these are the moments we train for, the fact that there's an Olympics uh, coming up next year. It's exciting. Um, it's what every single one of us here are going to be working towards and trying to achieve. I say 26 of us full time. Olympics is normally 16. Um, so yeah, everyone will be doing their bit to try and make sure that they get on that plane, I guess. I'm massively excited to kind of see what the squad can do in the build up to it. So pro leagues is something obviously last year we experienced. Um, how that will look differently next year with the, the, the away games being two games and home. Um, and the, the build-up to the Olympics, um, having more fixtures than training, I think will be really, really exciting. Um, so something that I'm massively looking forward to. It's going to go quick and you've got to do everything you can to you know, get picked one, but also we have a very good chance of doing well. Um, so it's really exciting and like I said, off the back of qualifying, I'm extremely motivated to make that happen and um, make sure, you know, this could be a very good nine months, so it's about making it that. <laughs> I'm just really excited because I feel like we've made so much ground in that last block to get us to the qualifiers, to get us qualified in the first place. And that's such a nice feeling because I just think the whole group will have learned a huge amount from that there. And we needed that. We needed to see how hard we need to work to get results, to enjoy then those results. And I think you've got to go through that process to understand it. And, and, then, to, and then I think winning is even more sweeter. And, and it makes you want to do that day in, day out more here. So I think the fact we've been through that now as a group sets us up really well for this next period because I think we'll work and train harder than ever. Um, and then, uh, yeah, it's now just kind of settling the group down. The coaches will do what they've got to do to kind of decide who's going to be the likely 16 uh, to represent us in, in Tokyo. And um, yeah, it's, it's just a, an exciting phase. We've got Pro League, uh, so we'll be on the road again a little bit there. and. Um, We'll just take it step by step and, and, and continue to, to like, you know, try and make a little bit of progress every single day. The knowledge of what we did essentially in seven weeks as a GB team after the Euros, to, um, what we can then do in seven and a half months, um, I think it's going to be pretty exciting. Um, I also know how quick that time will go. Everyone said it to me last time before Rio, kind of 2016 will fly. And um, I know that 2020 will absolutely fly. So we've, it's about making the most of every single moment that we have together out on the pitch, in the gym, um, in meeting rooms. And um, yeah, I'm just incredibly excited. Um, I also know that selection comes um, before, before the Olympic Games. So it's all about making sure that you are doing your best, but for the team, because it'll be the best team that goes um, to the Olympics. So it's about making sure that every single one of us are in the best possible place to push for that spot. Heads up, pay attention now. Eyes on me, we're gonna let the beast out. Caged up, held down, put thoughts alone. You ready? Be ready. Breathe in. Legend